Nusantara, the new capital of Indonesia, is well underway. Ridwan Kamil, one of the best-known architect and urbanists of this country, the fourth biggest population in the world, is at the helm of this landmark project, guiding wide-ranging decisions from form-making to green performance to urban livability. Today, Ridwan is back to shed more light on the making of Nusantara, on the kind of city this mega-project promises to be. But visually, it will be a forest city, but internally, it's very smart with a net zero a footprint. The, the whole Nusantara, if executed well, can be a model in Indonesia, maybe around the world. A project of this size will have a massive impact on the local economy. But what about natural ecosystems? To reduce and limit the environmental damage, uh, we promote retaining the, the area and maximizing the supply from the nearby resources. At the end of the day, uh, we will have a real green city in Indonesia. Tourists may well come and visit, but why would anyone relocate? Moving to Nusantara will benefit Jakarta future as a global city. You have a better life, you have a better income, lower income tax, lower uh, corporate tax, a win-win solution to everybody. Ridwan Kamil is now running to be the next governor of Jakarta, a race to be decided in just a few days. Is president of Indonesia next? This video is sponsored by the Holson Foundation for Sustainable Construction. More on them later. Welcome back to Ikagradia, Ridwan. In the last episode, the first of this two-part conversation, you and I talked about Nusantara, the next capital city of Indonesia, under construction since 2022 in East Kalimantan. Now, we've only just scratched the surface, discussing at first what would set Nusantara apart from past purpose-built capitals like Brasilia, Canberra, Mm. One clear difference is that we are today far more concerned with environmental impact. So now, let's look at the goal of living in harmony with nature. Mm. Yes. For instance, Nusantara has been described as a forest city because there will be specific acts of rewilding. It will also rely on renewable energy as the main source of power, the use of electric vehicles. Overall, it aims to be a net zero carbon emission city. Let's get specific about how these goals will be realized. Give me an example of a building in Nusantara that you feel represents the ambition of the city as a whole. Yes, I think uh, the good one that I can tell mm -hmm. is the design of the vice presidential palace by an Indonesian architect based in Singapore. We've interviewed the architect, Xiao, previously on the podcast. Yeah, you know... Uh, Florian and also Dana, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, the the brief is how to create the vice president's office and palace to be green and sustainable. So the research about the climate and microclimate within the site. They research the 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 issues of how wind coming and the the sun direction coming to the site. And they use this dynamic to create a brief on how the geometry will respond to the current site. Yeah. In order, at the end of the day, the architectural geometry to it will be interesting as a new design, but also really specific uh, respond to the sustainability aspect of the site. So I can prove uh, that the design is really scientific. And it's really up to the world-class standard that we need to see it in we, we have several meetings to make sure they deliver all this uh, green and sustainable uh, dimension that are coming. So if we combine this mindset to hundreds of buildings, I'm very confident hmm. that the whole Nusantara, if executed well, like this vice president design of Shao, can be a model to the whole new development in Indonesia, maybe around the world. That visually will be a forest city, but internally it's very smart, very sustainable, it's very sensitive, and mm. uh, aiming to have a net zero a footprint. Mm. I've seen images of the project. There is a lot that this project intends to do that aligns with the goals of sustainability in the tropics. Yeah. So, for example, uh, building in Nusantara, we have two options, yeah. The top floor, either 100% for uh, harvesting the solar, like the presidential, uh, vice presidential palace. The roof is majority for solar. Or you make it a full rooftop for small forests. Yeah. So there is no 
for example, a roof type in Nusantara that just a waste of use, just only for aesthetic. Mm. So I think this is also uh, the new thinking that uh, the architecture of Nusantara is what we call it, uh, not 100% up to the architect. We have to follow a certain rule. We have to find aesthetic and geometry with the respect of uh, having a net zero or having a good uh, response to energy efficient and sustainable design. You mentioned rules. Could you give me an example of a code or a standard that applies to all buildings in Nusantara mm. that will help yes. the city reach its targets? Yes. Uh, in Nusantara, we have a code called BGH. It's Indonesian abbreviation. It's a green code of Nusantara. You have to pass this green code and Nusantara expect a high a point of this code. It's 130 to 140. Which is like a platinum uh, certificate for, for buildings. Yeah. So we try to apply... That's minimum. That is minimum. So by having this scientific uh, requirement in our building codes, I'm very comfortable and very secure that everything that will be in Nusantara is already checked to be a green uh, and the building performance to be uh, in a high level of, uh, what you call it, compliance mm. to our green building code. But that's the next step after, for example, after the vice presidential palace got approved by me as a curator, they move to the next stage. So the next stage is to pass at least 130 to 140 points. I think that's the process to ensure that Lusantara Green is not a gimmick, it's a real thing, it's a scientific. At the end of the day, uh, we will have a system of real green city right, in Asia. Right. Now, there are all these internal targets uh, for the city and its buildings, but a development of this size is going to greatly impact the region as a whole. It's bound, for one, to transform the economy of the area, isn't it? which affects many communities and townships and natural ecosystems. How will these communities and numerous systems be protected from harm? For instance, what about the two townships of Balipapan and Samarinda? What's in place to protect them? I think from the economic point of view, uh, there is already proof many economic benefit here. Balipapan is so busy right now because people are coming to Nusantara, they stay in Balipapan, they have lunch, dinner in Balikpapan, the, the price of the land increase, yeah, the need to create a housing in Balikpapan, a uh, new hotel in Balikpapan also increase. Also Samarinda, another city, uh, we call it a triangle city at the end of the day. Yeah. Samarinda, Balikpapan, and Nusantara will be three musketeers yeah, of urban development in East Kalimantan, for example. So economic-wise, it's already proven to be uh, promoting the, the, the growth and the increase of economic activity. Second, also the nearby island like Sulawesi, where the supply of stone or supply uh, of everything, material construction, because you cannot, you know, ship everything from Jaffa Island, for example. You have to combine some local resources. Of course, uh, we uh, already uh, tell the president that the Sustainable city is also how we practice the logistic way of doing and building a city. Uh, the green also means uh, we reduce the carbon footprint by uh, maximizing the supply coming from the nearby resources, for example. Yeah? Uh, not everything imported. So in, in Nusantara, we set up a minimum percentage, mass majority coming from local resources, less from imported uh, resources, for example. Also, uh, to reduce and limit the environmental damage coming from this development, uh, we promote them to uh, regreenering the, the area, for example, the quarries. Yeah. And we use the economy of carbon trading because if you, for example, finish greening the, the quarry mm. uh, to be like what we have doing in Jaffa Island, you can sell this project to, to carbon trading. You get money uh, by greening the, the brownfield, for example. So I think uh, this, the, this is a policy that we are doing 
uh, to make sure uh, we limit the damage of environment while building this new capita. I'm not saying we don't have problems, yeah, but we try to limit the problem by having this practice and policy in place. You mentioned reliance on locally sourced materials, but East Kalimantan includes many sensitive ecosystems. So it's not just about how you design green buildings or what you do within metropolitan boundaries of Nusantara. It's also the impact of your actions on the ecology of the region at large. So unless the supply chains are held accountable to clear environmental impact guidelines, Mm. this objective of local sourcing may, in the end, create massive environmental problems. Yes, as I said before, uh, it's a bit beyond my jurisdiction as curator, but I remind the authority, the administration of ECAN mm. to reduce the carbon footprint of everything imported too far or from around the world. The other challenge for new cities hinges on people being led to relocate. I mean, they displace communities that are in the way and they require others to populate the new development. Let's start with the latter. Why would anyone move to Nusantara? I think if you go to Nusantara, the promise is you have a better life. So it means you have a better income. That's why I said to you before, uh, this is strategy need to be decided in presidential level. Because Nusantara is already given the policy that you can be a bit independent uh, to make decision compared to to other cities in Indonesia. So it means you can create your own regulation on how to lower income tax. You already have uh, 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 rules that you can make a decision to lower the corporate tax, for example. By having these, uh, then makes sense for people to come to Nusantara because it means you do nine to five, but you make bigger income because uh, the the Nusantara will tax you lower than if you live in Jakarta, for example. That's one thing. And also for corporations, you get lower uh, corporate tax if you build something in Nusantara compared if you build something in Jakarta, for example. Right. Uh, my short-term strategy is to build what we call destination and tourism-based uh, 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 strategy. To, to bring people come to Nusantara. Because to create a real business city, I think is still mid-term, yeah. but for long-term, it's government activity and tourism activity will be the short-term. And hmm. mid-term will be a, a business activity and long-term, at the end of the day, it will be a full-scale city where government, business, tourism become the the fight and become the, you know, the, the ingredient to be a real city. An Indonesian government official reportedly said that if civil servants don't perform, if they don't pull up their socks, they will be sent <laughs> to Nusantara. In other words, Nusantara was presented as a as a kind of punishment. Yeah, you know? no, no, no. This underscores the fact that civil servants, if they want to keep their jobs, may not have a real choice. But what about the politicians? Will they continue to have homes in Jakarta or elsewhere? Will they be flying out on weekends? You spoke in the previous episode about making Nusantara livable. What about making it lovable so that people want to spend part of their lives there? I think that's a very difficult question, Seth, because uh, all the things that we call it lovable right. takes a very long period of time mm. because within this long period of time, there is a new culture coming, mixed with the old culture. Right. And, and so many things that really need takes time. That's why if this question asks for the short-term Nusantara, I don't think the lovable point will be happening because it's just a building. It's just an infrastructure. But when the people come and inserted the culture as something unique to Nusantara, then the the issue of lovable yeah, can be happy. Now my target is to get livable first in this short-term plan <laughs> right. and maybe lovable in the mid-term or long-term. So livable, I I fight for to make sure the building is contributing the liveliness of the city, the vibrancy of the city by by contributing all the ground floor to public use and mm. also 
uh, creating an event, international event. It's like a Singapore, they have a, what you call it, a, a F1 a event, yeah, to, to bring people. It's like in Dubai, they create a series of event, global event for people to come. Mm. So Nusantara will follow also, not only using the infrastructure and architecture, but also using event economy to bring people and they will need to have lunch and dinner and accommodation and at the end of the day, create jobs, create economy. So, but with the promise of better, uh, more tropical and more green, uh, greener uh, architecture in place. So I think uh, my answer is, as a government official, it's your, what you call it? It's your obligation to follow wherever the country needs you. Yeah. And this is a historical moment. You have to go out from your comfort zone living in Jakarta mm. to move to the new capital of Nusantara. Maybe not comfortable in the first year, but I I think as a curator, I try to to give them assurance. At least the built environment will be nice. Back to the question of who will be impacted by this development. There are concerns about displacement of indigenous communities. What about their rights and livelihoods? Uh, and this is something also I have to clarify in Imonga. I think 95% the land, I don't know the right number yet, but I can claim more than 90% belong mm. to the to the country and give lease to this paper company uh, to produce uh, these plantations of eucalyptus tree. Uh, but yes, within this 10%, it belong to the people. I think the administration of Nusantara has a procedure to give compensation, but at the end of the day, it's always an issue uh, in every project in Indonesia. We are not China, where the land belongs 100% to country. In Indonesia, you have an issue of how to deal with private owner of the land. Uh, so I tell you, Majority is uh, on the right track. Uh, so there is no big issue on or conflict in dealing with the indigenous local people. Some uh, have some issues of maybe not satisfied with the compensation, for example. Yeah? But it's very limited in my opinion. But I think there is no way the president or the country would harm its own citizen. They want to, to have Nusantara is a great story to be a win-win solution to everybody. So I think uh, we are in the concept of making everybody happy, uh, including uh, the displacement of the indigenous people. Uh, that's very minimum to the site of Nusantara in total 300,000 hectares of, of Nusantara. Coming up next, I asked Ridwan how will Nusantara be funded? Who bears the cost? Also, do trained architects like him have the right skills to become effective politicians? But first, let me quickly tell you about the world's most significant competition for sustainable design with a total prize pool of 1 million US dollars, the Wholesome Foundation Awards. Francis Carey, the acclaimed architect, won the Global Gold Award in 2012. Prior to winning, few had heard of him, and since, his profile has skyrocketed. At EcoGradia, we celebrate award winners like Kerry. This year, we're spotlighting the 2023 winners in an exclusive webinar series. And who knows, next year, you might well be a part of this inspiring group of change makers. The portal for online submissions for the next cycle of the Holson Foundation Awards is now open, and it will stay open until February 2025. It's free. Find out more in our show notes or at awards.holsonfoundation.org. One final challenge that all new cities share is the massive injection of capital that they depend on. Many cities in the past have struggled because of a shortage of cash flow. Now, the Indonesian government has said that 20% of the 30 billion US dollars needed for the new city will come from taxpayers. But this also means that the rest will stem from private investment. Yes, to create a city, you have to combine between the federal or government money and also private sector money. Yeah. And when we talk about private sector money, divided into two sources, domestic investor, 
Indonesian-based investor and also international investor. Uh, but there is a confusion in the mindset of general public when you talk about investor, they translate it into international investor. Okay. But actually investor is domestic. So what's happening today is domestic investor already placed 4 billion US dollar. Uh, that's why I'm busy uh, reviewing hospital, reviewing apartments, reviewing shopping malls, reviewing hotel, because it's real and majority 100% are coming from the domestic investment, total 4 billion US dollar and more, but not yet international investor. So that's the reality. Because I think any international investor would be very more careful on how to, to come and invest in Nusantara without seeing the progress. Mm. But I think optimistically it will come after seeing the manifestation of local domestic investor project being built the next three to five years in Nusantara. So I think that will be the, the, the root on how urban economic work and also why the domestic investor also uh, coming to Nusantara is because the lobby of the President Jokowi. President Jokowi lobby many domestic investor, the big scale investor, to use Nusantara also as a part of nationalistic uh, gesture, yeah, not just purely B2B business. Yeah. Uh, so it's a chicken and egg. You build a hotel first or you wait for the people first. So it's so some domestic investors follow the president's uh, uh, advice. Let's build the hotel first. When the hotel is there, then the people will come. Yeah. Instead of waiting for population first, then build hotel. So, so some risks already taken by domestic investors. It's already built, total of 4 billion US dollars. If you come in, in September, you can stay in this private sector hotel, a five-star hotel that's being built in the So I think this, this will be the route. Domestic investor for short term, and I think internet investor will be in the next term. Uh, I have to fix the confusion to public which one is domestic, which one is international. Right. Here is something that comes up frequently in conversations about Nusantara. Some say that Jakarta, the current Indonesian capital, is being deprioritized. Now, Jakarta has many environmental challenges. I mean, it is congested, it is polluted, its ground is sinking. Uh, if there is only a finite amount of public funds available from which a big portion is diverted to the creation of a new city, stands to reason that less will be spent on existing cities. How will Indonesia do both? Build a new capital and rescue Jakarta? I think my first answer would be to remind all this concern uh, public that Nusantara is not deprioritizing Jakarta. It's been there since colonial time, as I said, in the historical context. Yeah. It's not about the situation of Jakarta today. No. The moving of capital has been there since colonial time, only executed in today's context. Second, because Nusantara will take time yeah, to be a city, I don't think Jakarta in the next 10 to 15 years will be impacted too much. Jakarta will be still the center of economy of Indonesia. Uh, Jakarta uh, will be reduced by the government official population, but not by the general people. I think people that come to Nusantara will not be dominated by Jakarta. People who move to Nusantara will come from all over Indonesia who see Nusantara as a new city with a new opportunity like Batam in the early stage. Yeah? Batam was nothing and now busy with many people coming to Batam. It's like the Balikpapan story of the corporation city becoming the real city and so on and so on. So I think not to worry, in my opinion, Jakarta will still be the center of economy, uh, reduce population only by government official population. And the question of Jakarta also is more interesting actually, because Jakarta will have having so many empty government buildings. So what happened to this like, I don't know, 15 to 30 high rises in Jakarta that will be empty? because moving to Nusantara. So the new governor of Jakarta will have to come up with solution idea or new vision 
how to bring Jakarta to global city using the the left behind buildings of government building that located strategically in the prime area, maybe becoming a hotel, a museum, or something very interesting will be happening to Jakarta. So I think, in my opinion, moving to Nusantara will benefit Jakarta future as a global city. I think that will be my optimistic note of Jakarta future. Let's take a step back from your curatorial role in Nusantara and talk mm. about some of the other public appointments that you are known for. Yes. Now, you were mayor of Bandung from 2013 to 2018. Prior to that, you had a successful practice leading interesting projects. Why did you decide to run for office? I was an angry citizen, Nima. I was, so I went to politics because I was angry and I said to myself, okay, let's take over the city and let's build a new vision with this political power. So the, the main point uh, when I decided this is, I, I, I remember in 2012, I proposed to design a public space under the highway. Okay? I presented to the mayor. I, I said, mayor, this is my design, my contribution to my city. Uh, if I'm doing this professional, I get paid very expensive, but I make it free for the love of city of Bandung. And that time the mayor didn't care, <laughs> didn't listen, didn't implement of my contribution. So because of that moment, I said to myself, the city do, does not appreciate my contribution. Therefore, I have to make a change. I have to create uh, a way to change the city. And that way is election. Mm. So I think uh, after that, I learned that if you hold the power, you can change everything. You can influence, you can make the life of your people so big of a change. That's why I created a lovable and livable, livable and lovable concept. I created 40 projects the five years as a mayor. I re redesigned all the garden, the city parks. I make the pedestrians uh, available to everybody. I make the city livable. Maybe a little biased, but I sometimes think that architects can make good mayors. Did your professional background as an architect and an urbanist prepare you for the job of a mayor? <laughs> I like this question. Uh, why? Because I, in my bias, but honest opinion, I think the best mayor are architects, okay? Ibu Risma of Surabaya, social affairs minister, was also an architect. And there was another mayor in Ujuk, in Makassar, Pak Dani, also an architect. Because we as an architect, we train to solve the problem, okay? And we as an architect, given different questions, different contexts. And we have to create solutions that are faster and affordable. Because if architect, you know, design a fancy, nice geometry, but expensive, that's not something remarkable. You are remarkable if you design a nice geometry solving problem with affordable uh, uh, costs. So my training as an architect to find affordable solution is becoming uh, a good uh, mindset when I become a mayor. So did you know that 30% of my projects coming from CSR money, not from government money? This is also something I never tell many people. The Alun Alun, the main square of Bandung, was built not by government money anymore, but by uh, CSR money, okay? Because I lobby the business uh, community in Bandung uh, to contribute to the city of Bandung. So this is also the power of mayor, but with the creativity as an architect. Second one, remember during architecture school, every day we are criticized by our professor about our works. So, you know, so the mindset of, oh, what you call it, strong. <laughs> <laughs> and accustomed to criticism, it's helped me during a mayor. Because in the era of social media, people tend to bully the leader, whatever they have problem, they 
they ask and they criticize. So I'm I'm become a stronger mayor because my training as architect. Every time we present our work to our professor, we get criticized many things about issue. So combination of mentality that are strong and mentality of solving problem with affordable solutions. Mm. As an architect, we are trained to do to imagine, yeah, to to create. So yep. combining of solving problem, but also a moment to create new things, imagining things is also helping mayors to create a, a right. better future. Following your stint as mayor of Bandung, you were from 2018 to 2023 the elected governor of West Java. Now, West Java is home to 50 million people, yes. much bigger scale than the city of Bandung. What were you able to achieve at that scale? Yeah, when I become a governor, uh, I have to control 27 uh, political uh, area, uh, around seven in the form of city, and the 20 is regions. So as a governor, I have to manage what we call rural economy. I have 5,000 villages uh, during my administration. So we call a different approach, uh, Lima. For the city, I copy the Bandung model. Yeah, I copy it everywhere to the urban context. But for non-urban, uh, I rely more less to physical, but more to the system. So I created a digital field. Yeah, I transformed the mindset of the digital economy into the digital fields. I created a millennial farmers uh, to to regenerate the, the farmers from the young generations. Yeah. And my data, uh, I'm very proud. When I started as a governor in Mount, I inherited 1,000 poor status villages. When I finished my time as a governor, from 1,000 poor status villages, now zero. So I created architecturally a public space or connection to the waterfalls yeah? uh, in some rural area, creating a touristic and contributing to local economy. I, I fix the the connection, uh, the the road, the street, leading to the destination of economy. I created the homestay projects, so I renovate the homes of the rural people, so people can stay instead of hotel. They can stay in the rural homes and give money to rural people. Uh, and this is the the economic approach uh, that I use uh, to elevate my rural economy. Combined with urban approach and this rural approach using digital, this created these 500 awards that I had during my time as a governor making a big change. Red one. Now, I know some of my listeners would not forgive me if I don't ask this question. Okay. Would you consider in the not too distant future running for president? I think, in my opinion, anyone in Indonesia as a dream to become a leader, to become a president, right? But that fate or destiny will be decided by the future time. But if you ask, do you have aspiration? Yes, of course. But whether this durable or workable, who knows? Maybe if I work perfect, better serving people, then that opportunity will come automatically. Fair enough, I'll take that. Last question, Ridwan. Yes. What gives you hope? Every time I see my children, Nina, so this is very true. Every time I travel with my daughter, every time I travel with my my son, I look at them and say, uh, they have to have a better city, better life, better environment, better future. Uh, that's why I work very hard for their generation, for them, for them, for their friends, for their generation that they have to live in a better world, a uh, more beautiful world, more peaceful world. So I think I work for them. That's the reason I, every morning, I push myself to be energetic and give him a high hope to my future. Well, with that, thank you so much for your time, Red One. No problem. I hope the next time you're in Singapore, you'll give me the opportunity to meet up again. And if I'm in Bandung, I'll come knocking. Okay. Good luck, Red One. Thank you and take care. 
Thanks also to you for joining in. If you've enjoyed today's conversation and haven't done so yet, please click the subscribe button on this screen to always know when a new episode is out. You can also follow Ecogradia on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, on Instagram and other social media, and subscribe to our newsletter on our website at ecogradia.com. Until we meet next, this is Nirmal Kishnani, signing off in Singapore.